I rejoiced when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. But where to when the house is shut? Into the world, for the whole earth belongs to the Lord. This is Pentecost. Today we give thanks for the gift of the Spirit. So let us worship God and let us go into all the world. Brilliant. Right, come on, girls, come on in. Party time. Right, I think I've got everything. I've got birthday candle, I've got my lights and I've got party poppers, and I've got a balloon as well. Right, we're all sorted. It's his birthday, is it? Oh, it's the church's birthday. How can a building have a birthday? Oh. The church is people, not a building. Holly's right. It's not the building we're celebrating, it's the church. This is not just like a hundred years ago. We're celebrating the church's birthday. And it's a time called Pentecost. And in Pentecost, we remember the day that the church really got started. And the Holy, and on this day, it was over 2,000 years ago, the disciples and a whole bunch of people were in a room. And suddenly, there was this wind that came through the room. And they realised that it was the Holy Spirit that was in the room with them, giving them the tools and the knowledge of and how to do the things that Jesus had asked them to do. Do you remember a couple of weeks ago when we were in church, we talked about Jesus saying that he would leave us something, the Holy Spirit, after he left. Do you remember that one? So, Holly, can I have the balloon a minute? The thing about a balloon is, just now it's not really much of a balloon, is it? It's lifeless, it's not got anything in it. But when you blow in it, Give you a minute. Right, you finish it off. When you blow in it, <laughs> when you blow in it, it suddenly has power and purpose. And that's a bit like the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit gives us the power and the purpose to do the things that God wants us to do. And then, if you imagine our birthday candle, the disciples suddenly saw that there were tiny little flames <laughs> above each of their heads. <laughs> in that room as well as the Holy Spirit being in that room and they knew at that point that they had work to do and that work's still going on 2,000 years later yes in buildings but all over the world because people believe that the Holy Spirit is giving us everything we need to be the church wherever we are so let's get our party poppers right you ready so there's only one thing left to do then Let's sing happy birthday. Right, let's go for it. One, two, three. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear church. Happy birthday to you. Hip, hip. Hey, hip, hip. Hey, hip, hip. Follow Jesus all around the world. Yes, we're the church together. The church is not a building. The church is not a steeple. The church is not a resting place. The church is a people. I am the church. You are the church. We are the church together. All who follow Jesus all around the world. Yes, we're the church together. Some people received the Holy Spirit and told the good news through the world to all who would heed it. I am the church, you are the church, we are the church together. All who follow Jesus all around the world, 
Yes, we're the church together. I count if I am ninety, or nine, or just a baby. There's one thing I am sure about, and I don't mean maybe. I am the church, you are the church, we are the church together. All who follow Jesus all around the world, yes, we're the church together. Good morning, everyone. On this Pentecost Sunday, we are going to pray together. And in this prayer, there is a response. And so when you hear the words, Spirit of the living God, if we all say together, fall afresh on us. Let us pray. God of Pentecost, today we praise you for a promise kept, a people filled, a church empowered to share the good news of Jesus. For the Spirit came, emboldening, encouraging, energising and equipping, loosening tongues and setting hearts on fire with the truth of your love. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. God of Pentecost in these strange days, unfamiliar and uncharted, we confess to you the ways we have limited and stifled your spirit and offer ourselves once again to you this day, praying that you would renew and guide us into the future. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. God of Pentecost, filled and fired up, may we, your church, trust in your unchanging love. Be open to your spirit at work in all our dreaming, praying, planning and serving, and be emboldened, encouraged, energised and equipped to use our gifts for the growing of your kingdom as we shine brightly and follow your lead, confident that you are not only within us and beside us, but always in front. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Amen. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though that was shorter. For God said, if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people around by the desert road towards the Red Sea. The Israelites went up out of Egypt, ready for battle. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, because Joseph had made the Israelites swear an oath. He had said, God will surely come to your aid, and then you must carry my bones up with you from this place. After leaving Sukkoth, they camped at Etham on the edge of the desert. By day, the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, so that they could travel by day or night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. Amen. When the day of Pentecost came, all the believers were gathered together in one place. Suddenly there was a noise from the sky which sounded like a strong wind blowing and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then they saw what looked like tongues of fire, which spread out and touched each person there. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to talk in other languages as the Spirit enabled them to speak. Amen. And thanks be to God for these readings from his word. Shaking, let hearts awaken. Our God is.
I love the hills and the mountains. And to be clear, I'm talking about the Scottish mountains. Why bother about the rest when we've got the best? In some of those mountain areas of Scotland, I've become very familiar with through the years from repeated visits, not least the Angus Glens and the mountains around them. I know them inside out, particularly Glendall. And one of the Munros at the top of Glendall, it's called Drish. I've climbed it 19 times. I've been up it in the depths of winter and in the heights of summer. I've been up it in the middle of the night and in the day. I know it's every turn and it's every aspect. That mountain I am so familiar with and I love it because of that. But just as much, I love exploring new territory going to parts of the country I've never been to before. Yes, exploring, discovering, finding new landscapes. Now, when I go to new places, I'm much more dependent on my map and my compass for navigating. It's a comfort to me to be able to guide myself on the map. Or maybe I'm out walking and I'll come across a path 
or maybe some muddy footprints. And that's a great comfort too, to know that others have been here before you. But what about if we're called to completely new territory, where there is no map and compass to help us? To go to undiscovered country. The reality is that there's hardly a place on earth now that hasn't been discovered. I guess that's why I love reading so much about the early explorers. And it's one of my favourite books about the first Europeans to go to Everest uh, and to try to conquer it. I love reading too about Shackleton and those who went to the poles and to the Antarctic, um, endeavouring, um, seeking out. There's not much opportunity for that nowadays, but even still we can take ourselves out of our familiar places. This is one of the best books I've read of late. It's called The Call of the Wild. The Call of the Wild. A man who went to live for a year uh, in the depth of the Alaskan tundra and forest. I wonder if perhaps that's what's being asked of us right now as the church. That we need to, yes, go beyond all that is familiar. To hear again something of the call of the wild. To go beyond what's known and dear. For many of us this causes us all kinds of anxiety. We're far better when we know exactly what's happening. In terms of church, Sunday mornings, going down to our buildings, running our services according to patterns we've used for long enough, meeting together in our various groups and organisations, and then the pastoral life of the church, visiting one another in our homes and so on. So, with everything being so different, we find ourselves very disorientated, not quite sure of the landscape, not quite sure of ourselves. Our deepest longing is to get back to what we know. In all of this, we begin to get a glimpse into the experience of how it's always been for God's people. Think of those Israelites after crossing the Red Sea and after a period of time in the wilderness, it was so disorientating and so unfamiliar to them. The demands were so great, they actually wanted to go back, even though it would have been back into captivity. Or long before that, Abraham, listen to the beginning of chapter 12 of Genesis. The Lord said to Abraham, leave your country, your relatives and your father's home and go to the land that I'm going to show you. Of course, he had no idea where that was, what it was going to be like, let alone how to get there. And then those first disciples, when Jesus came to them, met them on the beach at Galilee, he asked them to leave everything that was familiar and to come with him to become fishers of people. And then the Apostle Paul and so many others risking all for the gospel, even up into much more recent times of church history. Missionaries from Scotland like David Livingstone going into unknown territory. Or what about Mary Slessor, born in Aberdeen and raised in Dundee, and then off under the call of God to Nigeria, and what a work it was she was involved in there. Mission is still where it's at. The only difference is we don't have to go anywhere. It starts right on our doorstep. Friends, we've got to rediscover that essential calling to mission. Here's the thing. It's going to take something of a makeover, maybe much more than that, a reformation for us to be in the kind of shape we need to be, to be the church for mission in Scotland and beyond in the 21st century. For starters, we're going to have to learn to travel much more lightly, to lay down so much of the baggage that we're carrying. When I first started out in my hill walking journeys, I used to take everything with me. <laughs> I had such big packs that I could hardly walk, never mind hike around. And then of course I had to learn that you don't need the kitchen sink with you everywhere you go. And now I'm perfectly happy with just a, a small pack like this. When Jesus called and sent his disciples, this is what he said to them. He sent them out two by two and he ordered them, don't take anything with you on the trip except a walking stick, no bread, no beggar's bag, 
no money in your pockets. Wear sandals but don't carry an extra shirt. What are we going to have to learn to lay down? What baggage are we going to leave behind us? And how are we going to find our way? Like never before, we're going to have to trust in and depend on God. He's always been there and he will guide us. Your word, Lord, is a lamp to guide me and a light for my path. Can we trust that to be true? God will lead us by his word and by his spirit. And today we rejoice in the gift of the spirit. The spirit that has gone before God's people in every time and place. The Israelites through the wilderness, though they knew not that territory, had a pillar of cloud before them in the day and of fire by night. And those first apostles trusting in the spirit, knowing that at times doors would be closed to them and at other times opened for them. And what about those saints of old who first came to these shores of ours bearing the gospel, trusting in the blowing of the wind to bring them where God would have them be. And now, will we be ready to go where God is leading us? Will we allow ourselves to be remade, remodeled into the kind of church God needs us to be now? Will we allow for that reformation, for that revival, and at this time of Pentecost, for the refreshing Will we pray, Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you will lead me. Will we believe his word? This God is our God forever and ever. He will lead us for all times to come. Church, this is our shot. This is our opportunity. Let's do it. And let's do it in the name of the Father and the Son and in the power of his Holy Spirit. Amen.
We've sung, Thank you, O my Father, for giving us your Son and leaving your Spirit till the work on earth is done. What is that work that we are called to and that the Spirit of God will equip us and enable us for? How would you sum it up in seven words? Let us pray. Spirit of God, who hovered over the waters of chaos and cradled all possible things, who filled our forms of clay with the very breath of God, who came down upon the uprising sun in white bird blessing, who swept through the Pentecost crowds with fire, with joy. Spirit of God, breathe for us once again. Breathe for those who cannot breathe, whose shallow breaths betray damaged lungs. Breathe for those whose breath catches with grief. Breathe for those who are drowning in debt and driven with anxiety. Breathe for those who hold their breath in fear. As old certainties give way to new confusions, breathe deep, fresh air into the lungs of your church. Fill us with energy, with resolve, with clarity of vision to meet the challenges of our time. Spirit of God, in the name of Christ, breathe for us once again. Amen.
And now, friends, let us go, trusting that God will guide us. And as we go, may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you. 